Well, but no further ado then. Um, welcome. Uh, good morning. It's really lovely to see so many brief fellows. It's lovely to see some colleagues from English. Um, it's, uh, we're extremely um, uh, pleased to be able to be welcoming Holly Dugan again today um, for a, a longer and more extended um, discussion around her work, which was really tantalizingly given to us in scent. Um, in senses yesterday afternoon, which was really very exciting. And we're looking forward to having this conversation. Um, as I said, if you're online, please do feel free to use the chat and the Q&A function because we'll monitor that to make sure the conversation can be happening after um, the discussion. But in terms of a formal introduction, this is again, part of our Breathe theme. This is our last week this year of Breathe events. Um, wonderful sort of set of things have already been happening over the last few days, and this is our final day. So we are very delighted to be starting it um, today with Festering Lilies. I'm going to turn over to my colleague, Jen Fitzpatrick, who's going to do a more um, detailed introduction of Holly for this space, and then that we'll set off and we'll be trotting from there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcia. Um, I should say that when uh, the Breathe team started to think about this topic and what it might involve, we were discussing what breathing means for human health, what breathing means for the planet in which we live, and we were thinking about good air, uh, bad air, all the theories surrounding what it means to breathe and be healthy. And we thought about bad air quite a bit. And we thought about what prevents us from breathing in a healthy way. So we were thinking about disease, we were thinking about asthma, we were thinking about lung health, and quite a lot about the health of the planet as well. So the fact that the planet needs to breathe and human activity on the planet is preventing a lot of what, what we tend to talk of uh, fresh air, good air, clean air. And then we're thinking about well, what does our smell like? What, what are the smells that we find positive and what are the smells that we don't like? And I was thinking about this as well in the, in, in the drive-in today. And I was thinking about how nature is very clever about working out which particular smells we kind of instinctively, and I think, um, I think probably, you know, universally, the kind of smells that we do not like. And I was thinking, well, what, what are the worst smells in the world? And one that kind of came to mind was the smell of a rotten egg. I think we all know instinctively when an egg has gone off. And we were talking about this yesterday evening as well. Uh, other smells that are really unpleasant, you were in your provocation, you were talking about the smell of the rubbish dump, the smell of uh, something going off, something, something going bad. I think we're very good at, at, at thinking about those, those smells. And I think what's interesting about Polly's uh, talk today is the fact that she's using in a really interesting way the bad smell and the good smell. So lilies, I know lilies tend to, to divide people quite a bit. Like I said, <laughs> my brother-in-law hates the smell of, of lilies. But when lilies have become rancid, they're a very different type of flower. So I was thinking about these nice smells. And um, when we were discussing the brief team, uh, who we might want to come and join us as, as a fellow to, to talk about um, all these, all these um interesting ideas around smells and scents and breathing. I thought Polly, because Holly is the go-to person when it comes to nice smells, those good smells, perfume. So perfume, such an evocative, such, um, a, and in some ways, such a kind of a, 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 an ephemeral substance and such a personal substance as well and then I got to thinking about all the nice smells so just off the top of my head it was the, the smell of the babies a freshly bathed baby top and powder that wonderful smell the smell of sunflowers perhaps so I was thinking what's my favorite smell and I, I think the smell is so evocative the smell makes us it brings back memories it makes us feel good so when we think about the air and breathing 
it's not only bad things like the air that is coming from the, the refuse dump that is unpleasant and that causes us to, to struggle with the breath. There are also really interesting scents. And I'm going to, to end this little preamble by uh, referring to some poetry. And poetry has been coming up quite a, a bit in our discussion yesterday. Uh, Marsha was, was began her, her introduction with a poem. And the, the poet, the 19th century poet Wordsworth, talked about spots of time. And he's talking about memory. And I think sometimes we don't consider enough just how the bottom of smell can be in triggering both bad memories, but also good memories. So the smell perhaps of, of a lost one's um, perfume can bring that person into the room. So perfume is a really important, very uh, evocative substance for us. And Holly's done a lot of work on, on, on perfume, on uh, natural scents as well that come from nature, like rosemary, and um, you know, Holly's work on sense on the senses and the specific sense of smell is um incredibly important work. So I'm going to be quiet now. I'm going to stop talking about smells and I'm going to hand over to Dr. Holly Dugan from George Washington University, who's going to talk about that that wonderful flower that some people <laughs> can't stand, which is the lily. Thank you. Can we come back to Thank you so much for that introduction. It's incredibly um, moving. I am really, especially from a scholar whose work I respect so much. Um, and I also want to thank Marsha and Kieran and Bhavna and all the fellows and their hosts for such a warm welcome this week. Uh, I found it really inspiring. I don't have a scent cue with me today. Yesterday I presented quite a few, um, but I wanted us to think about absence um, and what, how in a historical past we might begin to access a phenomenological experience of sensing and smelling um, when the object itself is lost. And I mentioned this because one of the things that's interesting about perfume is that so many of the smells we encounter in modern perfumery are synthetics. And they're synthetics because we've over harvested uh, the natural ingredient or there's harm done to the creatures and you know, the animals whose um, lives are <laughs> uh, you know, transformed into scent ingredients. Um, and also there's tremendous expense. And so one of the things I think is challenging about an archive of olfaction is that you may think you're encountering an authentic smell of the past, but in reality, it could be very, very different in terms of its olfactory and aroma chemical structure. And then also in terms of the social concept context that surrounds it. So absence is partly where I want to begin. I also didn't bring it because I am one of those people who can't stand the smell of lilies. And I mentioned this because I think having antipathy towards smell really underscores how powerful it can be in defining social space. It can immediately call you in and make you feel welcome, or it can very powerfully and immediately mark you as excluded from this realm. And I think what I hope to show today is that lilies are indexing that very thing of who's called into a social community and who's excluded from it through social norms of beauty that we'll see um, vary in terms of their visual and their olfactory properties. Um, so as Joan described, my work has really focused on material culture. Um, in my book, I thought very deeply about <clears throat> smells in the past. Um, how early modern people encountered the world around them and how they uh, experienced it and then tried to describe it. And I found that there were certain kinds of scent ingredients that opened up olfactory worlds of the past in really rich and compelling ways. And I tried to, rather than uh, trace a, a traditional historiographic 
history of smell. I tried instead to access these moments in time in order to invite the reader to think about what smell and olfaction can do in terms of cultural history. Um, and so I focused on incense, roses, sassafras, rosemary, ambergris, and jasmine. Um, since then, this is very much in conversation, I was inspired by the work that Joan did on culinary arts and Shakespeare, really laid the groundwork uh, for thinking through what a historical approach to sensation might mean, what it you know, could open up for understanding of Shakespeare studies, really thinking about that material history and how it is different than this contemporary moment allows us to really see these important spaces that define the Renaissance, you know, the church, the court, the context zone, the shut-in household, the market or the garden, um, in powerfully different ways when we shift our sensory modality. And since then, I've continued that work. I've thought about the smell of death. Um, and I think that, again, one of the interesting things about smell is that there are very few aroma chemicals that produce a universal and almost universal response in those who smell them. And they're usually those that are around the extreme smell of mortality. And I was interested in that and thinking about what that might mean for staging practices around, say, a play like King Lear. How do you stage the smell of death? Um, and what might it mean to have a king on stage talking about that smell? Um, particularly when you don't necessarily want to recreate it, right? You very much still are invested in that power. I also thought about the smell of political revolt in a play like Coriolanus, in which the people of Rome are repeatedly configured as a plague upon it. Um, and there's this great line in that play where you know, the question is, who is in the city? Right, who counts as a part of that city. And in those metaphors of the people being a plague or the sewers of Rome, you can see how they're constructed as waste, as excremental waste that is, can be physically removed from the centers of political life to disastrous result right, in this play. But again, Shakespeare, I think, is interested in that. And early modern London um, was struggling with that as well with its own infrastructure challenges in terms of a period of political Grow, uh, political change and increasing population growth. Um, I also thought about this in terms of same-sex desire, sort of what it might mean to represent the desire between women on stage in a place where ostensibly you don't have women working as actors in this realm. Um, and I found, uh, again, metaphors of smell as an invisible yet very um, intoxicating, delightful, dangerous scent really fuel that play, as well as a number of misogynistic claims that just seem to come with smell um, at work in that place. So I was really interested there um, around what it might open up for desire. And then I've also, and this is not Shakespeare focused, but I shifted to 17th century women's poetry to think about what the smell of juniper offers up in terms of pain and understanding pain narratives in the past. And so I've continued that work of really thinking through what a particular scent ingredient or what a particular play or context or space might help us to understand about the past that we're missing if we're thinking primarily in visual or oral registers. And here's where I want to start to take up one of the questions that came up in yesterday's session, but that I don't think I explored as fully as I could have in that moment. And I want us to think through what it might mean to have mixed metaphors or where we might begin to see smell. Neuroscientists argue and have shown that the experience of smelling a lily, represented here on my right, your left, um, of seeing someone smell a lily, uh, and then also of reading and a description of someone smelling a lily, all activate the same areas of the brain. There's something really interesting in how these three different ways of encountering smell um, trigger a memory, a sensory memory. Now, all three of these work, I think, if you've had that first experience, those second two are hinged. So you can conjure forth a memory if you've encountered this. But it becomes a different question when you have it. And this matters for historical research, because what I'm saying, and importantly, is that those aroma chemicals have changed. We can't directly access them. And so we want to begin to reverse engineer this phenomenological experience through written descriptions of what encountering it might be like, and then also connecting that to the visual traditions of representation. Artists, and part of the argument of my book and part of my argument for the humanities in a 
program like this is that artists are interesting interlocutors for understanding that relationship between culture and science because they have highly mediated and trained skills in order to represent these phenomenons. But they also sometimes unknowingly encode social norms in them. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. Um, and I'm referencing my colleague Will's book here because I think it really captures where sensory studies is now. Um, and in this book, and I just, it's open access, I highly recommend it if you're interested at all in this topic to go look at this. Will has a number of examples. I'm in the Renaissance, and so my examples will be focused there, but he has a much wider range. Um, but he maps out three different ways we can start to think about the role of smell in the past, this problem that I just sort of mapped out here. Um, and we can think about smell in the past, smell and the past, smell of the past. Smell in the past is where my original work has been grounded. I'm really interested in thinking about what the smells were in the past and how early modern people encountered them. So it doesn't matter that I don't like the smell of lilies. What matters is that Shakespeare finds it interesting and I'm interested to know what his readers do with that metaphor. Yes, and I think that's an important piece of it. Smell and the past will, and the team at Oderopa are really showing, can function in and of an archive of itself. That is, if we are losing these aroma chemicals because of climate change, because of forest and um, deforestation, because of violence, what we need to do is start preserving them, to think through what an archive of smells might be like and how we can begin to code these um, so that researchers can access them in interesting ways. And I, I think this book is a really interesting tactile symbol of this because on the one hand, and if you weren't here yesterday, this is a book from a museum exhibit of perfumes of extinct and impossible smells. Um, but, and, and so it, it's perfumed recreation. It's very much a kind of artistic rendering of it, but it also functions as an archival history in and of itself, because this is a book from 2008. It's a scratch and sniff technology. And when you're encountering it, you're encountering all the other readers who have interacted with this book as well. And in and of itself becomes a history of both extinct and impossible smells, and then also of reading. I find this haptic connection to the archive powerful. I think it's powerful both because it puts us in, makes history come to life in really interesting ways. But I also think it warns us about what some of the more challenging aspects of the historical past and the histories we want to write about might mean if we're embracing them in an embodied way. And that's partly what's driving my work today. And then finally, um, Will in his book suggests, and the Oderopa team suggests that we also need to begin to think about what this work is doing in synchronic moments across a long durée, a longer history. That isn't the story that we've been told in that first wave of sensory history about shifting sensory modalities, about sort of how we can start to think through technology. That work is fascinating, important. It has opened up social history. It has made my work possible. But where we're at now is what do we then begin to build towards? What are the new narratives of history that happen when we put these together? Together. And what I'm hoping to present to you today about lilies is speaking to that. I want to look at two discrete moments. One is a medieval moment, looking at religious images of lilies that importantly have their stamens and pistils removed um, in order to see what the visual argument of whiteness and chastity is being made in these images. And then I want to shift gears, move forward in time, and look at what Renaissance sonneteers do with lilies, particularly when they pick up that image of chastity and seek to bring smell back into it. And what we'll see is that they begin to notice that lilies and festering lilies um, decaying offer up a profoundly rich warning about sexual contamination, warning that has a lot to do with gender norms and as I argue, racialized norms. Um, and so I'm gonna be thinking about Shakespeare's sonnets, uh, but I have other sonnets uh, that do some of the similar things. 
Um, in doing this, I'm drawing on recent work in environmental humanities and modernity, uh, particularly Sean Shu's work in The Smell of Risk, in which he argues that risk perceptions in literature often function through olfactory tropes, that smell becomes a very powerful and visceral way in which to encode social norms of racism, of um, heteronormative politics, and of misogyny. Um, and so again, the other important point that Sean Shu's work adds to this, uh, particularly of smell in the past, of the past, and the past, is that we need to, again, grapple with the idea that environmental risks are not evenly distributed across populations. Um, and what happens when smell becomes a tool for sensing and staging those differentia uh, differentiated atmospheres. And so I'm thinking here of Swati's work in the presentation yesterday, right? Again, when we think of a, a playwright like Samuel Beckett, that's staging waste for an audience in one particular way resonates differently with an audience who encounters waste on a much larger scale. And I think uh, Sean Shu's work really gets us to thinking through, okay, then how then does that knowledge, that understanding of that disparate, um, disparate impact begin to change if we go back and think about Beckett. And I'm interested in thinking through that and going back to Shakespeare. So part of the claim that I'm gonna be making is that Shakespeare's sonnets, the gorgeous, um, literary pieces of art are doing some sinister work around race and we want to think through it together, hopefully. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to just shift into the humanities mode and begin reading, I hope. Um, and I, I'll try in the middle when I have some gorgeous art to kind of break that frame and kind of get us back into our bodies and then think back again together in close reading. Lilies, especially white lilies, are complex visual and metaphoric symbols in the Renaissance. Associated with Hera and Juno in ancient mythology and with purity in ancient Jewish traditions, lilies come to signify the Virgin Mary's divine chastity in medieval art. And I'm very interested in when this happens. And if you might know this flower, its, it's scientific name is Lilium candidum, but you might know it as the Madonna lily. And that association of this flower with the Virgin is something that happens in time at a particular moment in order to solve a problem of race. And this is one of the things that I'm going to be arguing that's happening in the medieval moment. The flower sensuous qualities, the visual whiteness of its petal and its strong scent are particularly constitutive of its representational power. For medieval and early modern audience artists, white lilies signaled purity, but lilies also decay rapidly, releasing a strong scent as they die. For poets like Ronsard and Shakespeare, the smell of festering lilies provided them with a powerful metaphor about the unseen dangers of desire. The sensuous qualities of white lilies as symbols of both sexual purity and contamination help to solidify cultural ideas of chastity, beauty, and whiteness as discernible phenomenon. Lilies, I argue, show how beauty was configured as a corruptible whiteness. Though we're often used to thinking of race as a visual phenomenon, these lyric poems and their metaphors of lilies demonstrate how olfactory tropes help to bolster visual clothes of gender and race. Because smell has been positioned as a fugitive sense within Western philosophical traditions, it's a powerful medium for representing what Sean Shu describes as risk perceptions in literature. Whereas Shu's analysis focuses on the health links between modern and postmodern literary genres and environmental health hazards, it's a tremendous book. Uh, olfaction also conveyed fears about contagion and risk in pre-modern genres like lyric poetry. Festering lilies imagined in juxtaposition to the white lily as a symbol of virginity signaled through olfactory registers the unseen but debilitating effects of sexual contact with unseemly partners, linking the stench of fetid flowers to a met metaphorical blight on white bodies. White lilies, I argue, were an important eco-material marker of race, infusing descriptions of their beauty with visual and olfactory qualia. Lilies function as an important metaphor of whiteness in Renaissance literature, drawing on the flower's religious symbolism as well as its botanical history. Here, I argue that lilies document how smell functions more broadly within discourses about race, religion, and gender in the Renaissance. As Kim Hall has argued, English sonneteers drew upon a wide array of sources, 
in order to create powerful metaphors of desire, particularly in their descriptions of a metaphoric and physical blackness. Commenting on the ubiquitous deployment of black fair imagery and lyric poetry, Hall argues that sonneteers described beauty in paradoxical ways, describing a beauty that could be both black and fair, dark and white. Doing so signaled poetic prowess. Positing a mistress as dark allows a poet to turn her white through poetry, to refashion her into an acceptable object of platonic love and admiration. And that's Hall's argument. Again, brilliant. <laughs> Whereas Hall explores the connotation of lyric poetry through metaphors of darkness, I extend her argument here to examine metaphors of whiteness, configured in Renaissance poetry as lilies, both floral and perfumed and fetid and rotting. These metaphors built upon the visual and religious symbolism of the flower as chaste and beautiful, emphasizing through depictions of floral stench that beauty can also deceive, decay, and rot. As Jonathan Reinhardt argues, notions about odorous others abound in histories of race and smell. Perceived stench, he argues, is a racializing process that extends back to antiquity. Smell is rooted in cultural norms. Disgust about certain smells reveals occluded processes of habitation, including social norms and beauty ideals. Poetic metaphors of the perceived stench of festering lilies point towards implicit codes of gender and race embedded in the flower's religious symbolism. If pure white lilies represent divine chastity, festering lilies represent the disfiguring effects of sin symbolized by decay and floral stench. The ecological and literary histories of lilies intertwine in the Renaissance, creating a powerful metaphor of aesthetic and social norms of chastity. White lilies have long been valued for their visual and olfactory blue beauty. They bloom early in summer with tall stems and erect flower beds, which emit a pleasant fragrance. Their natural habitat is the dry and mountainous regions of the Balkan Peninsula and the hills and mountains of Palestine and Lebanon. But lilies also thrive as cultivated plants and have been traded in the Mediterranean region for over 2,500 years, giving us a long history to start to think about this change. Ancient writers emphasize both the color and the smell of the flower. Um, Greek naturalist Theophrastus divided lilies into two groups, red and white. We're going to see this come back in the Renaissance, um, describing the former as crinon and the latter as lyron. Pliny the Elder described the lily holding the highest rank above the rose, noting both the beauty of its fragrance and the whiteness of its petal, and describing it as lilium candidum. The noun candio in Latin describes a brilliant, glittering, and illuminating whiteness. But Pliny the Elder also describes the twofold nature of the lily, emphasizing the flower's prominent pistil and stamen. These function as if they were a second flower. For Pliny, only the white petals of the lily are valued for their smell. Lilies are, for the most part, a hardy botanical species, but unspotted white lilies are incredibly rare. Those that do exist in the wild last only for a few days, a few fleeting moments before the pollen from the stamen falls on the petals, causing orange-colored spots. Spotted lilies become heavily scented, a natural horticultural effect that helps with pollination. Spotted lilies can be a sign of disease, however. Lilies, especially white ones, are susceptible to botrytis, a fungal infection that accelerates rotting and causes orange and brown spots to appear on the leaves and petals of the flowers. Removing the pollen from the stamen as soon as the plant blooms mitigates these effects. You maybe do this at home as well, right, because it gets everywhere. Removing, uh, excuse me, images of the flower from antiquity and in the early medieval period often depict lilies with their stamen. But what happens at a particular moment is that we start to see these images of the flowers with their stamen removed. And that fascinates me. I'll talk more about this. Um, but what it has to do is it brings up an important problem um, in medieval exegesis. Um, and so what we start to see and why I think it becomes important about when folks start to represent lilies with the stamen for move has to do with medieval anxiety around the Song of Songs. The botanical properties of the flower, especially its smell, made it a powerful symbol. 
Biblical allusions to lilies associate the flower and its perfume with erotic desire and religious faith. And this comes from the Song of Songs, who famously, again, the singer, the bride of the Song of Songs, famously begins by describing herself as black and beautiful. Um, later, though, as we'll see, right, the second line, um, like a lily among thorns is my darling among the maidens. So what we're going to start to see is that medieval um, exegesis and medieval theologians begin to solve the problem of the first sentence by focusing in on the second, that is using the lily's striking whiteness as a way to talk about and render the blackness of the bride as metaphorical. I'll talk more about that here. The bridegroom also describes uh, love as flourishing as a lily among thorns. Uh, he describes his beloved breasts as two young rows that are twins, which feed among the lilies. And the bride describes her lover's cheeks and lips as aromatical spices set by the perfumers as lilies dropping choice myrrh. These gustatory and olfactory illusions connect the beauty of the flower to sexual and sensual pleasure within marriage and as a metaphor for the appropriate relationship um, between the church and God. In other parts of the Bible, lilies are associated with religious faith. In the Sermon on the Mount, Christ admonishes those who desire colorful adornment, advising them to consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. These many transitions of passages across history make it almost impossible to identify with certainty the species of the flowers mentioned in the Bible. The imagery, however, describes a plant much closer to Lilium candidum than what we would now identify as lily of the valley. Um, though Lilium candidum is no longer prevalent in Palestine and Lebanon, it is possible that it once was, and its strong herbaceous stem and erect flowers provide a powerful image of a white flower that does not bend, toil, or spin. Medieval theologians interpreted the frank depictions of erotic desire and sensuous pleasure in the Song of Songs as a spiritual allergy, allegory of God's love for the soul, or relatedly, of God's love for the church. It was among the most frequently interpreted books in medieval Christianity, in large part because of its investments in metaphors of corporeality, especially as Julie Orlimansky argues, its intimate but peculiar phrasing and its cross-hatched invitations both to watch a spectacle of desire unfolding and to make the speaker's voice one's own. Writers such as Origen, uh, Ambrose, and Augustine interpreted not only the bride's blackness as a symbol of toil and of persecution of the faithful, but also the lily's whiteness and its smell uh, as a symbol of a purity of faith. Medieval theologians, and this is what's on uh, your right and my left, uh, began to connect such imagery to biblical passages about the apocalypse, particularly the dazzling jewel-like appearance of the risen Christ riding on a white horse. Such interpretations emphasize the metaphorical meanings of color in the Song of Songs, crafting an image of the church that was both vulnerable to persecution in the present and triumphant in the future. Lilies cultivated in gardens allowed the writers to extend this analogy further. Just as the bride longs for the bridegroom, so too do the faithful long for heaven. Ambrose imagines the chosen waiting in an enclosed garden uh, for judgment day, browsing among the lilies. In his exposition on the book of Psalms, Augustine also imagines the church as a flower garden, but one that must include both lilies and thorns, for just as white lilies grow among thorns, so too must the devout flourish amongst evil. The white lily represents a faith that is tested and remains pure. Bernard of Clairvaux, for example, interprets the bride's physical blackness in the Song of Songs as a powerful spiritual metaphor in his sermons on the Song of Songs. In doing so, as Bruce Holsinger has shown, Bernard's sermons also work to construct whiteness in Mrs. Holsinger's terms, in no uncertain terms as the color of salvation. By interpreting black, uh, physical blackness in the Song of Songs as metaphoric, Bernard's sermons engage with an increasingly globalized semiotics of color, interpreting the bride as a spiritual avatar for Christians, like the Knights Templar, who imagined themselves as subjected to physical and spiritual trials of faith. Holsinger argues, 
starting with Naibur Sam, two simple words spoken by the bride in the Song of Songs, Bernard produces an elaborate metonymic spectacle in which Black bodies are repeatedly and energetically gazed at, beaten, and penetrated only to shed their darkened skin and reveal an underlying whiteness of a Christian soul, and finally the resurrected body. Lilies are part of this construction of a metaphoric whiteness. In his sermons, Bernard insists that lilies too must be interpreted metaphorically and not physically. He delineates the bridegroom does not feed on the lilies, but among them, interpreting this claim as a sign of modesty and an invitation to refreshment in the spiritual meaning, meaning of feeding among the lilies. Okay. Now I'm going to just talk a bit through what does this mean? That sort of sense of feeding among the lilies, uh, it, <laughs> being a metaphorical invitation and not a physical one, I think we can start to connect to some of the artwork that I want to show you, which is how then do lilies show up in medieval art and what it might mean to visually see that same kind of sermon lesson embodied in this. I um, mean, so here again, we can begin to think through lilies in Renaissance art. And they show up in one particular place again and again and again, and it's in the moment of the Annunciation. And if you're not familiar with this tradition, this is when the Archangel Gabriel comes down to announce to Mary that she will become a mother and she will remain a virgin. It is a complex and weird thing to convey to someone. And what we see are Renaissance, are medieval artists really using the lily strategically to connote all of that um, narrative in a single and striking image. Um, and so here, um, one of the things that's really interesting is that despite the fact that there are tremendous floral imagery around the image, there's only one flower depicted in the narrow space right here, the lily. I mean, you can see it right there. And again, it is this particular species of lily. And what I want to begin to notice and ask you to notice with me is that it has its stamen removed. I became really obsessed with this. Um, and I became obsessed with this, not by staring at Renaissance art. I'll be honest with you, I have looked at many images of this and I have never noticed this before. What I found when I became interested in it is through Shakespeare's imagery of it that made me want to think more about how could a lily be both a symbol of chastity and then also in Renaissance poetry be a symbol of festering desire. Um, and here's the answer as the stamen is removed. And what we can see again and again in these images are these flowers particularly functioning in this way that these um, theologians have, have taught us to think about them as metaphorical symbol of a visual chastity of a visual beauty that can remain uncorruptible um, that's symbolized in the virgin birth. Yet another one, I don't have a close-up of the lily, but you'll have to trust me, there's no statement. Uh, same here. And again, and again, and again, you can even begin to notice here, it is both a representation of the divine in the space, marking a kind of earthly presence that's going to transfer onto the Virgin Mary. I mean, it's in this moment, there's different flowers that come to signal different moments in Christian um, biblical representations, but it's this one that I find again and again fascinating. Now I included this one because you can see prominently that the stamens are there. So they have the option, sometimes artists want to choose to do so, but by and large, for the most part, they're missing. Um, and I just, again, I think this is a really important piece of understanding that medieval allegorical tradition that is asking us to view lilies as visual signifiers, to not smell them, to not engage with their olfactory properties in order to hold a kind of um, religious narrative in place. Okay, I'm gonna jump forward now and talk about what starts to happen in the Renaissance. Okay. If white flowers signal sexual purity, 
then diseased flowers and other varietals begin to signal corruption, increasingly represented as a blight upon whiteness. Race making in the Renaissance was a complex historical process and many fabulous work um, from scholars now are underscoring and uncovering that. Um, so please see me if you're interested, I can give you an extended bibliography. Uh, and many of them are from scholars of color as well, which I think is important to, to recognize and, and note. Um, but lilies are only a very small part of this history. But I do think it offers us an important one in terms of sensory history, and I'll, I'll get to that in the end. Yet their role within it points to the ways in which whiteness came to function as an aestheticide marker of gendered and racialized identity, especially when posited against medieval and early modern notions of blackness. Smell, however, allowed writers to theorize movement between these dichotomous states of being as a symbol of holiness and purity and of contamination and decay, lilies function as a powerful figuration of whiteness vulnerable to contamination. In the 15th century East Anglian play, The Digby Mary Magdalene, for example, the saint's conversion is staged as an allegorical shift from the darkness of sin to the light of grace. When the allegorical figure of curiosity seduces the saint into sin, he describes her beauty and her body as a sweet lily. Your person, it is so womanly, cannot refrain myself, uh, sweet lily. However, and I apologize, I didn't read it in the Middle English. It would sound differently. However, once Mary Magdalene sins, her person becomes associated with the smells of hell. Stage directions explain that in the moment Mary rejects her sexual past, seven dot devils shall devoid from the woman and the bad angel enter into hell with thunder. The Magdalene's chastity is reconfigured first to smell like a sweet lily, lily, then as the stench of devils in hell, and then again as a reconfigured state of grace. She's fascinating. I've written about her before, but for now I'm going to go back to, to the Virgin. These patterns or figurations also appear in Spanish and French literature. As Mary Chain and Caldwell argues, the use of the lily in French heraldry infused its allegorical meanings with valences of morality. The lily, whether signifying the Virgin Mary, the virtues, the Holy Trinity, or even the French king himself, reveals itself as a floral foil to evil, sin, and corruption. And importantly, heraldic lilies were in fact irises, and medieval and Renaissance heraldic artists were careful not to conflate the visual and political symbolism of royalty, the fleur de lis, a symbol that mirrored the shape of the iris flower with the visual and religious symbolism of the virgin, the white lily. Both symbolic traditions emphasize the whiteness of the flower. One 13th century French choral song, for example, juxtaposed the lily's beauty with the stench of a dung heap. The lily's virtue, and here it's hard not to think of Beckett, and um, the trash from yesterday, uh, but the lily's virtue was its grace, that it could challenge that smell of corruption even in the face of overwhelming waste. Naturalist writers, and here's where the slide is now, fostered misogynistic associations between the breed's natural changeability and its olfactory properties, its role as a symbol of inconstancy, especially in women. In Batman upon Bartholomew in 1582, the English translator Stephen Batman juxtaposes white lilies to purple or yellow lilies, defining white lilies as pure and most mighty in working. He also notes that the smell of the white lily is the source of its grace. Nothing is more gracious than the lily in fairness of consent, in sweetness of its smell, and in effect of working and virtue. He warns his readers that touching lilies will defile them. Lily smelleth full sweet when it is whole and not broken and stinketh full swole if it is broken and froted with hands. Writers like John Gerard divided lilies into binary groupings, differentiating the them between tame, domestic, cultivated lilies and wild foreign varietals. These be sundered sorts of lilies, whereof some be wild, whereof the field, others tame of the garden. He continues, some are white, others red, some of our own countries growing and others from beyond the sea. White lilies are distinct from all others. The white lily has long, smooth, and full-bodied leaves, and upon them do grow white flowers strong of smell. Gerard emphasizes the flower's moral valences. For example, in his book of prayers, Gerard includes a prayer for the private family, invoking lilies as images of chastity. He instructs the faithful to pray that their marital bed remain undefiled. Let the marriage bed be undefiled. Let the minds of all be unspotted. 
Let them be violets of humility and lilies of chastity. Let them be roses of charity and balsam of sanctity. And Henry Ketchum describes the lily as clothed by power divine in purest white, fairest object of the eye, religion's weed and badge of chastity. The very thing that made lilies valuable in the garden, their ability to produce colorful varieties, thus becomes something salacious in Renaissance lyric poetry. In particular, the smell of festering white lilies came to represent not only the allure of sexual desire, but also the bodily and moral risks associated with sexual contact with people deemed to be corrupted. As Kim Hall argues, early modern European thinking was primarily defined through these black and white binaries linking medieval understandings of religious race to new concerns over skin color, economics, and gender politics. Paul's research again shows how these metaphors of beauty become a poetics of color, constitutive of economic and social histories. This poetics of color intersects with gender tropes of beauty and chastity in Renaissance lyric poetry. As Nancy Vickers has argued, Renaissance lyric poetry included gender tropes of power, especially in the widespread use of the blazon. Lyric poetry demonstrates in minute detail how the power to survey and describe beauty participates in wider social and economic histories of colonialism, including similar strategies of surveying and describing people, animals, flowers, and fauna of the Americas in travel narratives, as well as in scientific treaties. Lilies most often appear in Renaissance lyric poetry as visual metaphors about gender, describing the skin color of women's cheeks, hands, or breasts. In My Lady's Hand, Thomas Wyatt describes his lover as fair, comparing her skin to lilies and roses. With lilies white and roses bright, does strain thy color fair. In his epithelium, Spencer describes his beloved's breast as paps like lilies budded, a convention that Linda Woodhouse notices stiffly conventional, even in the 16th century. In the Amoretti, Spencer imagines his lover's Lily's hands holding his book of poems, such a weird narcissistic image. Um, and the smell of Lily's, however, signaled an eroticized sexual intimacy. And Ronsard's similiet simili imagines the tactile and olfactory pleasures of encountering a thousand pink diathenuses and lilies, their vines entwining him in an overwhelming amorous and perfumed embrace. Again, another really weird imagery um, from a, a sonneteer. In other poems, Ronsard specifies that his lover's skin is whiter than the lily, invoking visual tropes of beauty, but he also imagines her mouth as a fount of sweetness. Her breath is a perfume that breathes life into him. These olfactory references transformed floral poetic tropes into multi-sensorial metaphors about embodiment, connecting the olfactory aspects of the flower to eroticized imagery of sexual contact. Karolaska de la Vega, Sonnet 23, describes his lover's visual beauty, comparing the colors of her face to the lily and the rose, but he also qualifies at the end of the poem with a warning. His desire may soon cool, for just as the wind threatens the rose, so too does time alter affection. Like Aralesco and Ronsard's poetry, Shakespeare's sonnets invoke the smell of flower to create a sense of erotic imagery. Perfume, for example, and if you're not familiar with the sonnets, I'll just back up. Um, they function both as individual articulations of desire, but editors over time have arranged them into a narrative sequence. And so there are, most of the poems are just dedicated to a beloved who is young, white, fair, and rich. Um, and then some of the poems are then directed towards a beloved who is dark, old, and um, beautiful in a different way. And so one of the things that I'm gonna be showing is sort of how are lilies functioning in both half of this narrative sequence. I mean, this is sometimes described as um, to, you know, to, the, to the youth or to the dark lady. Um, and and the, the metaphoric references of that darkness are debated. I mean, they're debated through these codes and metaphors of beauty. What does, when Shakespeare signifies darkness, 
Is he referring to a metaphorical darkness, such as the medieval modes would suggest um, our theologians would want us to interpret that as a kind of metaphor and not as a physical mm -hmm. code? Or is he talking through what we know about London in this moment in time and sort of the emergence of a wider variety of peoples living in that space and what the desire might be that's happening and unfolding in a heterogeneous space? Okay, back to the sonnets. Perfume, for instance, is prominent early in Shakespeare's sonnet sequence. Sonnet five and six, known by many scholars as the perfume sonnets, uses perfumery as metaphor for non-normative erotic desire. And here you can sort of see this. Perfume solves the problem of time, right? Just as we saw Garolasco de la Vega warning his lover that time is going to cool, time might make that flower's beauty bloom and then decay. Um, Shakespeare's offering his young lover here an option. Option. You could perfume your scent. You could distill it. You could make it last. Um, and not surprisingly, how does one do that? It's through the power of Shakespeare's poetry. Um, per like poetry, perfumery is an art that can bypass the cyclical aspects of nature, preserving beauty through artistic intervention. Later in the sequence, however, smell functions differently. The smell of flowers is a natural essence, more trustworthy than visual qualia. Shakespeare sonnets 94 and 95 exploit the disjuncture between vision and smell, crafting now a powerful warning for that same young lover about the pleasures and dangers of sex. And what's happened in this narrative sequence is that Shakespeare's poetic narrator now suspects that his lover is interacting with someone else, um, and so that he's now in a love triangle, and he's warning his beloved of the effects of that um, contact or that sort of uh, union on not just their relationship, but importantly on his beauty. Um, it's now under threat. By the end of the sonnet sequences, desire seems to run counter to sensory qualia. Neither his five wits or five senses can dissuade his foolish heart, that's sonnet 141. And his two loves emerge as figurative angels and devils, the beauty of the fair youth corrupted by the temptation of the dark lady. Across the sonnets, smell is thus linked to the pleasures and risks of desire, indexing proximity to bodies through imagined encounters with flowers. Um, in sonnet five and six, the beloved used beauty is described as a sweet smell, preservable through the ravages of time, flowers distilled though they with winter's meat lose but their show, their substance still late sweet. And again, this is happening in the turn or the volta. It's a really important moment in this structure. Sonnets 94 and 95, however, rework this imagery using the smell of lilies to issue an olfactory warning to the fair youth that his beauty will not only fade, it will fester. As Helen Bendler argues, the tone of the poem is stern, one not of infatuation, but of social reproof and moral authority. While Harold Bloom suggests that the poet implicitly warns the fair youth to be fair and pure of heart. If read in sequence with the next poem, the impact of such imagery intensifies. In Sonnet 95, the fair youth's shame is imagined as a metaphorical canker in the fragrant rose, which does spot the beauty on thy budding name. His body is described as a mansion filled with vices and a shape, a space where beauty's veil to cover every blot and all things turn to fair that eyes can see. Vision, the poem suggests, can deceive, but smell cannot. Sonnet 95 reminds the readers that vice can be sensed, transcending the perfume imagery at the end of 94 and opening sequence of 95 into a powerful condemnation of the beloved's beauty and his name, especially if not used in the ways that the poet deems fit. In contrast, the poet's desire for a woman who is defined by her blackness is configured as a disorienting century experience. In Sonnet 127, the narrator notes that in old age, black was not counted fair, or if it were, it bore not beauty's name, but now is black beauty's successive heir and beauty slandered with a bastard's shame. Really strange imagery that I think is drawing on all of that medieval work on the Song of Songs and reconfiguring it in order to highlight not the beloved's beauty, but Shakespeare's poetic prowess. Um, and again, sonnets are always about articulating desire, but they're also about articulating artistic poetic prowess. 
Returning to the opening's poem's configuration of nature, time, and beauty, Sonnet 127 emphasizes the poetic artifice itself fares the foul in profaning beauty. For since each hand hath put on nature's power, faring the foul with art's false borrowed face, sweet beauty hath no name, no holy bower, but is profaned if not lives in disgrace. And it's hard not to imagine now that smell of the festering lily as a kind of sweet beauty that hath no name and no holy bower, but has been profaned. Reworking the imagery of the Song of Songs, Sonnet 127 hails a sweet beauty that cannot be described, but must be experienced. Sonnet 129 revels in the bodily aspects of beauty. The expensive spirit is a in a waste of shame is lust in action. And in Sonnet 130, such embodied desire is anti-poetic. His mistress's eyes are nothing like the sun, nor doth her breath smell like floral perfume. Instead, it reeks. Although the poet's point is to work against the logic of false compare, and that's Sonnet 130, he uses phenomenological markers of difference in order to juxtapose two kinds of sexual desire, one fair that festers and another foul that appears fair. Shakespeare's metaphors of festering lilies emphasize that the youth's beauty is valued because it is fragile and corruptible, whereas his metaphors about the embodied aspects of black beauty, especially in sonnets 127 and 130, luxuriate in the very thing the sonnet 94 um, denounces, which is stench. Read together, Shakespeare's olfactory metaphors point towards the power of smell to index shifting ideas of whiteness, beauty, and sexual desire. We can see this in his plays. The Princess of France states this explicitly at the end of Love's Labor Lost, rebuking the King of Navarre for calling vice a virtue. She swears instead on her maiden honor, yet as pure as the unsullied lily. The temper marker yet configures the lily as beautiful but vulnerable to tactile corruption. Elsewhere in his poetry, the sight of white skin incites lust and violence. In The Rape of Lucrece, Lucrece's skin is described by Tarkin as whiter than a lily three times before he rapes her. Tarkin explicitly connects the paleness of her skin to his lust. The poem also portrays rape as physically changing Lucrece, polluting her body, and staining her blood black. And in Shakespeare's play Cymbeline, Giacomo, uh, Giacomo also uses similar language to describe Imog Imogen's body when he hides himself in her bedchamber. She is fresh as a lily, whiter than the sheets. Like Tarkin, Giacomo's desire is inflamed by the sight and smell of her skin. Imogen is a fresh, not festering lily, at least until he tarnishes her reputation. Later in the play, she's addressed again when her reputation is restored as the sweetest, fairest lily. Yet this imagery of corrupted lilies also emphasizes how stench indexed other kinds of embodied difference. In a sonnet published in his Passionate Pilgrim, Shakespeare describes his beautiful but false lover as a lily pale with damask dye to grace her, none fairer nor none falser to deface her. Such imagery emphasizes that beauty, even the beauty of the lily can be deceptive. The white lily dyed damask hints at the false beauty of cosmetics, whereas Lucrece's Tarkin stained black blood demonstrates how floral metaphors of virtue quickly collapse into imagery of sin, lust, and violation. Even in the sonnets where Shakespeare seems to praise dark beauty, uh, his imagery moves from praise to blame with remarkable rapidity. In Shakespeare's comedies, lilies are sometimes used as metaphors by characters who try to exploit poetic tropes of whiteness and fail, making visible through malapropism what usually works in more subtle ways. Lance in Two Gentlemen of Verona makes an offensive joke about Jewishness. I won't repeat it here, um, but the punchline is that his sister is as white as a lily and as small as a wand. Flute in A Midsummer Night's Dream describes a radiant Pyramus as being most lily white of hue, a brisky juvenile, and an eke most lovely Jew. This occurs in the play within the play, just before Bottom, the character who plays Pyramus, enters the scene wearing the head of an ass. Like Lance's slur involving his dog, Flute's malapropism of Jew for Jewel twists the conventions of lyric poetry into an anti-Semitic comment about animality and smell, juxtaposed with references to white women and lilies. Metaphors of lilies thus appear in Renaissance poetry on a continuum. Fair and beautiful on one side, foul and sullied on the other. 
Shakespeare's imagery of festering and sullied lemons, lilies function as a risk perception, associating the hazards of sexual pleasure with the rankness of fetid flowers. As qualia that can be sensed, if not seen, the smell of festering flowers offers a profound warning about desire and its effects on the fair youth, later helping to discern between his two loves. In sonnet 149, uh, excuse me, 144, uh, the narrator describes sexual betrayer through religious colored coded imagery of his lovers, describing one as foul and one as fair. Two loves I have of comfort and despair, which like two spirits do suggest me still. The better angel is a man right fair, the worser spirit, a woman colored ill. Imagining comfort and despair as the better angel and as a woman colored ill, Shakespeare describes seduction and its effects of corruption. He goes so far as to imagine his two loves as a saint and as a fiend. Though he warns the fair youth that his beauty will fester like lilies, Shakespeare's sonnets end with increasing metaphors of desire as disease, charting the effects of sexual risk through unseen yet anticipated embodied effects. In ending the couplet of Sonnet 144, the narrator articulates his frustration of an unknowable outcome, forced to guess one angel in another's hell. Yet this I shall ne'er know, but live in doubt, till my bad angel fire my good one out. And fire there is often um, thought about as an embodied uh, description of sexual uh, contagion and disease. Shakespeare, like other poets, draws not only on the poetics of color, but also in smell associations to describe the perception of sexual risk, whether with a fair man whose sexual deeds will particularly fester in, like lilies or like a woman colored ill. In his 11 theses on the archaeology of the census, Yanis Hamalakis argues that the sensorial field is also a field of power, a terrain of contestations. Shakespeare's metaphors of smell, especially of festering lilies, function in precisely this way, mapping out a field of power through contested and paradoxical references to visual and olfactory beauty. Lilies as both visual and olfactory symbols enabled medieval theologians to craft a powerful religious metaphor about chastity and purity, um, but it also enabled Renaissance poets like Shakespeare to expand the symbolism, poetically exploiting the disjuncture between the visual symbolism of the flower's white petals and the cloying smell of its powerful perfume. Drawing on both the eco-materiality of lilies and their iconographic whiteness and religious discourse, Poets like Shakespeare use the divergence between Lily's olfactory and visual properties to index a host of value judgments about bodily norms. Imagining the fair youth as a flower, Shakespeare connects the substance of his beauty to his smell, imaginatively distilling it like a perfume in sonnet four and five or letting it fester and rot um, in sonnets 94 and 95. In doing so, Shakespeare maps sexual risk through olfactory metaphors, connecting poetic descriptions of visual beauty to embodied norms. Powerful and visceral, festering lilies demonstrate how the poetics of color so integral to Renaissance lyric depictions of beauty built upon multisensory associations. Mutable, spotted and festering, lilies came to represent a powerful figuration of a corruptible whiteness in the Renaissance mobilized through metaphors of smell. Thank you.